Uh, so we'll, we'll start here. Uh, hello, welcome to tonight's uh, NNA webinar, which features uh, Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos. Uh, before we start, just uh, for those unfamiliar with Zoom, we'll give you some housekeeping notes. Firstly, you're all muted and your screen sharing is off. So don't worry, you won't be thrown up on the screen for everyone to see. Uh, um, you can just uh, enjoy the show and, uh, and post your questions later. Our guest speaker, Konstantinos, will speak for 10 to 15 minutes and then I'll ask a couple of questions and then we move into the Q&A. To find the Q&A function, you'll have to look for an icon. If, you, if you're on the Zoom uh, app, it should be at the bottom of the screen. If you're on an iPad or an iPhone, you touch the screen and it comes up, uh, a menu will come up. You can't miss the Q&A uh, icon because it says Q&A on it. You need to find that because that's where you need to ask your questions uh, when it comes to it. Uh, we're going to keep to time, but we'll try and ask as many questions as we can. Um, the session is being recorded, including the Q&A, uh, for publishing on YouTube later. So please bear that in mind. You can ask a question anonymously if you wish, uh, if you don't wish your name to appear on that recording. Um, you don't need to wait to ask questions either. The moment we start, you can post your questions in there um, and, uh, and you, you'll, we'll see them come up. Please don't post them in the chat. There is a chat function, but don't post them in there because I won't see them. So they're very unlikely to be asked. Um, and there's also an upvote function. When you see a question in the Q&A, you'll see a little thumbs up. If you click on that, you upvote it. If someone else asks a question you'd like to hear an answer to, just click on that. And the ones that get upvoted most will go to the top. Uh, lastly, obviously we are solely reliant on private donations. So please, if you could help us, this in itself has, has a cost to the NNA. Um, if you're in the UK, you can donate by text, simply text NNA plus the donation amount uh, to 70085. Uh, there are other options to donate on our website. So you could go to our website at nnalliance.org and look for the donate button there uh, because you have plenty of options to do it from wherever the world you are. So without further ado, we're gonna introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos, MD, is a research fellow at the Onassis Cardiac Surgery Center in Athens, Greece, at the Department of Pharmacy, University of Patras, Greece, and at the National School of Public Health in Greece. He has been conducting laboratory and clinical research on e-cigarettes as a principal investigator since 2011. And as of late 2019, he's published more than 80 studies and articles in international peer-reviewed scientific journals about tobacco harm reduction. So welcome, Konstantinos. Thank you. You, you uh, seem to have a very old bio. As of 2020, we, I have more than 90, close to 95 publications, including a lot of studies about COVID-19 within a very short period of time. Um, and uh, I'm not now affiliated with the Onassis Cardiac Surgery Center. I'm affiliated with the University of Patras as a senior researcher with the, uh, with the School of Public Health. Uh, which is now uh, part of the University of West Attica and with the University of uh, Peloponnese Data and Media Lab um, um, uh, Data Analytics um, um, Department. So um, I, I would also welcome donations to NNA, but I want to clarify that none of these donation, donations is going to be delivered to me. I was not paid, I was not compensated in any way and I will not be compensated in any way for this um, um, discussion. So I want to have this absolutely clear. And I don't want to say anything more. I just want to hear questions, whether it's from you or from the audience, because you need to create the discussion, the debate, instead of uh, having me say my own words, which may not interest anyone, basically. So it's up to you. And I would suggest to either you ask me anything you want, uh, or have um, the audience and the um, viewers um, ask whatever they feel they need, they want to ask. Okay, let's let's start on COVID nineteen because um, because there's a lot of interest around this, and as some public health people have said, um, there's something strange going on. Um, but there have been a lot of studies, haven't there? I think I counted about two hundred and eighty so far uh, from what I've seen. So, what is the general message and and, and what can we take from it? And what have you found out in your studies as well? Listen, um, you know, COVID-19 is a respiratory infection. Being a respiratory infection, the first thing that we were uh, looking at was how bad it is for smokers. Because we know that smokers have increased susceptibility and uh, for, for respiratory infections. 
and the infections are also more severe in smokers compared to non-smokers. So when I started looking at the first case series that were released of patients with COVID-19 from China, and it's vital to talk about China. Why? China is one of the countries with the highest smoking rate in the world for men. 50% of men smoke. And we know also that COVID-19 is a disease predominantly of men. I'm talking about the severity of the disease being predominantly um, of, of men. Uh, most of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 are men. But when the first um, uh, case series were uh, being uh, published, we found uh, an unusual, and my first um, remarks and observations were in early March, uh, the proportion of hospitalized patients who reported being smokers was pretty low. The first case series, a big one with more than a thousand uh, uh, hospitalized cases, it was only 12.6%. The smoking prevalence in China is 27% in the whole population, and it's 50% in males. So it should have been more than twice that. So, but you know, uh, then I went to uh, up to five studies, which I analyzed in um, late March. I think it was March 23rd. And on April 3rd, I managed to get to 13 K series where the uh, prevalence of smoking among hospitalized COVID-19 patients, all these studies were from China, was one fourth, it was one fourth the expected prevalence based on population smoking rates. So three fourths lower, 75% lower than what we expected. This is huge. And of course, we know that there are uh, limitations and problems in this analysis because we didn't have the data sets. We didn't have all the data that we wanted. We mentioned all these limitations, but still it's four times lower. You know, something very, very bad with the recording of smoking must happen to justify uh, one fourth uh, the expected uh, prevalence. And as this grew up, more and more researchers from different countries were coming out with studies and we're talking about different research groups yeah not our research group um, finding that you know something weird is happening with smokers the other have no elevated risk to be hospitalized or in some cases they have a lower risk of being diagnosed with covid19 you know something weird is happening and this needs to be examined and of course, I want to clarify that since the first um, uh, observations, we never said that people should start smoking. And we never said that uh, smokers should continue to smoke in order to be protected from COVID-19. We've said from the beginning that smoking cannot be protective for anything. It's completely impractical and impossible to be suggested as a protective measure because of the harms associated with smoking but what we hypothesized is that what what is in smoking that causes this we thought the first thing that came to our mind is nicotine uh, nicotine uh, we know that it acts on the nicotinic cholinergic system a group of research of, of receptors that are available everywhere in the body both in the central nervous system, but also outside the nervous system in all parts of our body, including in immune cells. And we know since the early 2000s that the nicotinic cholinergic system is a system that controls and regulates the inflammatory response to any type of foreign invasion, whether it's a virus, a bacterium or whatever. And it uh, modulates the immune response. And we know very well that severe COVID-19 is not, is not damage caused by the virus itself. It's damage caused by a hyperimmune response of the human body, which means that when the virus enters the body, the immune system reacts fighting the, um, the, the virus, but it reacts uncontrollably 
And at the end, instead of suppressing this immune reaction, the immune reaction is growing bigger and bigger over time. And at the end, it is this immune reaction that causes the damage in the lungs, in the blood vessel walls, in the alveoli, and in all other organ systems. So it's what we call, and probably you've seen that, a cytokine storm. It's this cytokine storm, which is not uh, caused by the virus itself. It's the immune response that is left uncontrolled. And one of the main properties of the what we call the cholinergic anti-inflammatory system is a pathway is to control and modulate the inflammatory and the immune response. So this is mediated by nicotinic receptors, and these are called nicotinic receptors because nicotine is an agonist for them. So it uh, protects them and it promotes their activity, nicotine. And that's why they are also called nicotinic receptors. So we think, and our hypothesis, the hypothesis of our own group now, it's our hypothesis, is that the virus may probably attack these receptors besides what we know about the AC2, the enzyme which acts as a receptor for cell entry. We think that the virus may also attack these receptors, um, dysregulate them, I mean, prevent their normal activity. And in, if this is happening, then nicotine is going to compete with the virus for attachment to these receptors, but nicotine is going to protect and promote their activity instead of inhibiting their activity. So it will restore uh, the uh, control of the inflammatory response. This is our hypothesis. This is what we are working at. This is what we are doing with our experiments. Um, and um, that's why we suggest that a clinical trial on nicotine should be done not only in smokers, but also in non-smokers. Now, uh, give me one more minute to expand on that because um, someone may say that there are studies showing that hospitalized smokers have more severe disease and are more likely to have an adverse outcome compared to non-smokers. And this is true. I will tell you that in a few days, a study of ours, which is already accepted, is going to be published, an analysis of 30 studies of hospitalized COVID-19 patients. We evaluated the adverse outcome and the association between smoking and adverse outcome among hospitalized patients. We found that smokers are 55 to 60 percent more likely to have an adverse outcome. But, and this is a very important clarification that no one else is making, the true conclusion is that the very few smokers who get hospitalized, that's a key that no one makes, the very few smokers who get hospitalized are more likely to suffer an adverse outcome compared to non-smokers. And why do I say that? Because we didn't examine only the outcome, we also examined how many smokers get hospitalized compared again to the population smoking rate. And we found even when using the worst case scenario, which underestimates population smoking rates, we found that the uh, proportion of patients uh, with COVID-19 who get hospitalized and are smokers is one third the expected number. One third, again. So, I will repeat the conclusion and I will emphasize the first part because you will rarely hear the first part. And this is a key issue. Of the very few smokers who get hospitalized for COVID-19, these people, the very few smokers, have a higher uh, odds, have higher odds of having an adverse outcome by about 55 to 60 percent more likely to have an adverse outcome. So the studies like a study published by GLANTS, they are right, although the GLANTS uh, assessment was a bit of an overestimation probably because they examined fewer studies, 
we examined more. But again, we are talking about the very few patients to, who get to the hospital. And remark number two, and that's also something that we, you will rarely hear, it's only our group that is saying that. What is the difference between a smoker who is not hospitalized and a smoker who is hospitalized? The difference is that a smoker, once hospitalized, they will immediately, and rightfully so, stop smoking, which means that they will experience an abrupt cessation of nicotine intake immediately once they are admitted to the hospital. What does this mean? It means that their nicotine levels will drop to zero within eight to 10 hours from being hospitalized. So if our hypothesis is right and nicotine has some benefits, then the smoker who gets hospitalized will immediately within hours uh, be deprived of this benefit. Because unfortunately, and I'm not suggesting, of course, that people should smoke in the hospital, but unfortunately, no one is going to administer to these people nicotine replacement therapies. And that's very, very unfortunate because administering to a smoker who gets hospitalized for anything, it doesn't have to be COVID-19, NRTs is a perfect indication. It's an already approved indication for NRTs. And there is a scientific association in France which has a booklet of guidance for smokers, for clinical guidance for of uh, how to treat smokers who get hospitalized for any disease. The guidance was released last year before the pandemic. And they were giving guidance to clinicians that for whatever reason you have smokers hospitalized, you need to give them NRTs in order to relieve their cravings for nicotine. So it is uh, an administration of nicotine for the uh, official approval of these products, which is smoking substitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting you saying that. Um, it's, it, I'm wondering if some of it might be because of the, the stigma about nicotine in general from, from health Bodies, what does uh, it mean? Uh, what does it mean? Stigma. We are talking since the beginning. I, I will ask you if you want to check my first prepublication, which is I think March twenty second or twenty third. Since the beginning, we have been saying smoking is not a protective factor. It cannot be used as a protective factor against anything. Nicotine is an approved medication. Nicotine has been administered. 12 years ago, to 70-year-old patients with Parkinson who had not smoked ever in their life, and the nicotine in the form of a patch was administered up to a dose of 100 milligrams per day. Of course, gradual up titration, not from day one, but they reached to 100 milligrams per day Nicotine were not, was administered, administered for several weeks. And at the end of the trial that they gradually removed nicotine from their um, uh, treatment protocol, none of the participants were experienced withdrawal symptoms. None of them. None of them became dependent on nicotine. The same thing has happened with nicotine administered to non-smokers for Alzheimer's disease. The same has happened with nicotine administered to non-smokers with ulcerative colitis and inflammatory bowel disease. So there should be no predisposition, but there is, I fully agree with you, but there should be no predisposition for nicotine. Let me tell you my personal experience. I have been struggling even to suggest in my medicate in my publications uh, even to suggest a clinical trial of nicotine and let me tell you something nicotine in the form of a medication is going to be much safer in a clinical trial than many 
of the medications that are currently being tested for COVID-19. And it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be sa safer, because the worst that can happen is that there is no benefit, that's it. We don't expect any harm at all. So the worst case scenario is it's not going to help people. There are medications right now that are contraindicated for active infections, contraindicated, like the uh, anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressants. They are contraindicated in active infection and they are now being tested for COVID-19 clinically. And nicotine, which is not contraindicated for an infection, which is not even expected to have any serious side effects. The worst that can happen is some nausea, some dizziness, some maybe vomiting and gastrointestinal effects. Nothing serious is going to happen. We're talking about NRTs. We're not talking about smoking. And even the reviewers who are scientists uh, have this predisposition that you mentioned against you know, proposing anything like that. And I have to be very tough uh, and very persistent I'm not saying that I'm aggressive or impolite, but I need to be very persistent in trying to overcome this uh, unbelievable, in my opinion, predisposition and totally unsubstantiated. Because, you know, we were not suggesting smoking. We made that absolutely clear from the first sentence in the abstract, in the full text, everywhere. We didn't even suggest alternative nicotine products, non-pharmaceutical products. Never. We don't even mention uh, the name uh, of any product or product category. Nothing besides pharmaceutical nicotine replacement therapies. And still, we were facing a lot of opposition, in my opinion, completely unjustified. But at the end, I must say, that most of them understand um, the concept. They understand the, that it's perfectly appropriate to suggest something like that. They understand that we have a clinical observation with limitations. We have a hypothesis which started from an observation. That's important. And we are building this hypothesis and proposing clinical trial. There are many medications that are being tested right now based on biological plausibility, of course, but no clinical observation. So far lower level of evidence than what we have for nicotine. I think that for nicotine, we have a much higher level of evidence to justify uh, doing clinical trials with nicotine. I was going to mention about uh, the clinical trials because I've seen seen the ones that have studied smoking. I've seen the ones that are uh, talking about studying nicotine replacement therapy as, and the effects on that. But I haven't seen any, because I know we have a lot of vapors in here tonight, uh, studying specifically vaping. And I want to add to that a question we've got from Charles Hampshire Thomas. He says, propylene glycol is common to both cigarettes and vaping. Previous research in the 1940s has shown potential virucidal properties of PG. Is PG being explored in the current CV19 related research on smokers? So is there anything looking at vaping and is there anything looking at PG as well as nicotine? No, there, there is nothing. Uh, I don't know of any, study which is, uh, of any studies which have recorded vaping so they can give us numbers for vaping. There is one, uh, I mean, um, um, uh, survey of vapors, which is a convenient sample. You can't generate any important information from that. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Uh, there is not even any study on snooze, you know, which is another um, uh, possibility. Snooze is also a, a very um, um, uh, important candidate because it's a much cleaner form of nicotine uh, compared to tobacco cigarettes. Uh, you know, in many of my publications and in the one that is going to come out uh, very soon, I'm saying that uh, uh, we think that the potential and hypothetical benefits of nicotine are partially but largely masked by the adverse effects of nicotine. So 
if uh, by the adverse effects sorry, of smoking. So what we see with smokers, if the reason for what we see with, in smokers is nicotine, then the effects of a clean nicotine product like pharmaceutical nicotine products is going to be much stronger than what we observe with smokers. That's why the answer is not going to come from looking at what's happening with smokers or vapors or snooze users. The answer is going to come as with any other intervention from a clinical trial where we will administer nicotine in a cleaner form. Now, someone may say, yes, but we will administer probably nicotine in a form of a patch. But uh, what about inhalation? I will perfectly agree that ideally we should have used a, a, or we should use inhalation because the local effects are going to be much more important. We know that the hyperinflammatory response that is happening locally is much more important than what we see from measuring blood levels of inflammatory uh, cytokines because you know, with blood levels, you, all, you just have spillover from the specific uh, organ or compartment where we have the inflammation. It means that what's happening locally in the low organ is much more severe than what you see from measuring peripheral um, inflammatory markers. So local administration would have been ideal. And let me tell you something. Someone may talk about e-cigarettes and so on it's going to be virtually impossible for anyone to administer in a hospital setting, in a clinical trial, any cigarette. But nicotine can be obtained as a uh, pharmaceutical grade solution. 100%, 99.7%. You can very easily add that to a nebulizer and um, evaporate that, create an aerosol that can be inhaled in the same way that we give some bronchodilators. Another problem with that is that in the hospitals, they avoid delivering aerosols to the patients because, you know, you inhale, but you will also exhale some aerosol and healthcare professionals are afraid that the exhalation is going to transmit um, uh, virus, viral particles to the um, environment and may increase the risk of um, infection by the healthcare per uh, personnel. But I would, if we would have a bet, I would bet that inhaled nicotine would have been much more effective than um, nicotine delivered systematically through a patch or a gum or anything else. Well, that touches on a question Judy Gibson had asked, saying, do you believe the route of nicotine uh, dermal versus oral inhalation has a similar effect on outcomes? So you're saying that inhaling it would be more effective than just yeah but oral inhalation if she's talking about the oral inhaler the nicorette i don't know what's the name the brand name changes but if we're talking about the oral inhaler the, the medication well the medication is not an inhaler at all it is called an inhaler but in many many quotes because in reality what it does when you take let's say let's call it a puff is that you're just having some particles delivered in your oral mucosa, nothing more. There is no inhalation. Even the nasal sprays, they don't have an inhalation. The only thing that can deliver somewhat effectively nicotine uh, to the lungs is a nebulizer. And I can tell you, I don't even care if someone starts you know, targeting me or whatever. The best um, way of delivering nicotine to the lungs is going to be an e-cigarette. And that's, uh, um, I'm telling you with all honesty, and the reason is that the size of the particles are so small that they penetrate deep in the lungs. I can tell you, and that has nothing to do with the e-cigarette as a product, that we have used a very simple commercial e-cigarette device in which we introduced PG and a medication, nothing else, no nicotine or anything, a medication. And we did an animal study of a specific disease for which this medication is treating the disease. And we compared the medication delivered through any cigarette through by inhalation 
and the medication administered through the oral route, which is the normal route of administering the medication, and we had the same exact efficacy with a big difference that in the e-cigarette we were delivering 10 times lower dose than orally. Right, yeah, so far more effective. Um, we've, got, we've got another question here from uh, Chris Snowden. I think you might have covered this already, but he says, what do you think is more likely, that smoking nicotine makes COVID symptoms less severe or that it makes people less likely to get COVID in the first place? I would feel that it's, it, it, I would think that it's much more likely that uh, they will cut the virus at the same rate and would just experience less severe disease, you know, unless they quit their nicotine intake when they are sick. This changes things based on this hypothesis. You know, nicotine is going to disappear from your blood within eight hours of quitting, vaping, smoking, heated tobacco use or anything else, or removing a patch because uh, that's the half-life of nicotine. So you need to understand, you may be a long-term smoker for whatever years or a long-term vapor. But once you quit intake or a quit intake of NRT or anything else you take, nicotine levels will drop to zero in eight to 10 hours. That's the reality. It doesn't matter if you have been a user for 10 or 20 years. In 10 hours, it will disappear. And if this is the case, you know, quitting nicotine is going to be bad. I emphasize, if the hypothesis is true, we don't know, we haven't proven it beyond any doubt that this is true. As I said, only a clinical trial will prove that. But uh, we are working on looking at it in in vitro studies, in uh, computational modeling. We, 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 we have released a pre-publication where we used complex computational modeling and docking experiments. And we found that uh, using the three-dimensional st uh, structures of the virus and of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, we found that there are there is an interaction and there is potential binding of the virus on the acetylcholine nicotinic receptor. Um, but you need uh, evidence from in vitro studies, so cell studies or animal studies, and of course at the end you would need a clinical trial administering nicotine to patients. Otherwise, you know, you, you don't have proof that it works in a true clinical setting. Okay, we've got a question here on, um, on the mechanics of it, um, because we've said about the effects and, and the science and the research you've conducted and that other people have conducted, but how, something on actually how the disease is contracted. So uh, Richard Pruin asks, how does SARS-CoV-2 interact with the same receptor as nicotine and how does this affect nicotine users? So it's how the virus enters the lung and, and, and how nicotine protects. What's the mechanics behind it? Nicotine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are available everywhere. Uh, they are available in the lungs, they are available basically everywhere in the nervous system, but not only, but also in the immune system. B, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, they all have nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, alpha 7, there are several types of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, mainly the, the uh, cholinergic anti inflammatory pathway is mainly mediated through alpha 7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So, um, what is happening? Uh, we have found that a region of the virus, which is in the receptor binding domain, it means on the surface, which also interacts, a neighboring part interacts with the ACE2 receptor, um, can interact, it can interact based on computational modeling, it can attach on the receptor. If it attaches on the receptor, it will prevent uh, acetylcholine from working, which is the normal uh, neurotransmitter uh, and compound that is used by the receptor in order to stimulate its activity. Now, if the virus goes there, it will prevent the acetylcholine uh, from working on the receptor and activating the receptor. So it will uh, inhibit its activity. Nicotine is a competitive agonist. It goes there 
and it binds to the receptor uh, and it removes that's our uh, thinking it removes the, the virus it prevents the virus from attaching there and by having nicotine attached on the receptor it promotes the receptor activity it doesn't inhibit it's an agonist agonist means it promotes the activity if it was an antagonist it inhibits the activity so what we think is that the virus attaches to the receptor and inhibits its activity uh, nicotine is a competitive agonist which means that it will compete with the virus for receptor attachment and once attached there nicotine is going to promote the receptor activity okay we got one sp sp specifically on on snooze uh, which is quite interesting um you know getting away from vaping and inhaled products uh what's the uh, is there any uh research available on snooze users susceptibility to covid19 and would you expect the data to mirror the results of smokers that you reviewed and since no, snooze is yeah. since snooze is less harmful to the body could one expect expect less severe covid19 results for those who are hospitalized well i mentioned that a few minutes ago that a snooze would have been another case where we would have seen much better results because yes snooze is expected to be much better it's a much cleaner form of nicotine intake swedes have shown some interest in looking at that after we have published again and again about the effects uh, that we will we see on smoking so they announced that they're going to look at it but we have seen nothing yet um sweden is not um, very good at recording covid19 so i don't know if in the end we're going to have satisfactory uh, data in terms of quantity and quality uh, so i don't know what's going to happen but yes snooze would have been a candidate where um which is a product which is by far less harmful than smoking so if the effect is based on nicotine yes it would have been much much better the effect observed um through snooze use yes right. although because... snooze is not an inhalational product so you don't inhale nicotine uh, we would see the effects of a systematic delivery through the bloodstream so to the lungs not through uh, inhalation right we've got a question from jackie ori and she's asking on i think the key word here is prevention um could nicotine therapies replacement therapies be a possible prevention against the virus or is it something that just works when you contract the virus to fight it off um as i said and i think you you you, you had a similar question previously um what i was considering is that no smokers are going to get the disease at the same rate as non-smokers uh, but they will have uh, less severe disease but there are a couple of studies which are finding that smokers are less likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19, which is something strange. It seems uh, that, that means basically that, yeah, it, it is possible that smokers are also less likely to um, get infected with the virus itself. We don't know why. It's pretty complex. We still have to look at it. I think one of the proposals in France besides a treatment was also to administer nicotine as a primary preventive uh, intervention so give nicotine replacement therapies to healthcare professional who are not sick and see if uh, nrts will prevent them from getting infected with the virus okay we've got we've got a question from bobby duncan which is uh, about something on a wider um on the wider scientific side uh on study which was uh about nicotine and parkinson parkinson's sufferers which was was quite striking recently was it what what what's your what's your you know how could you sort of explain that one to us and, and what yeah. are the consequences of it it was the british doctor study the study that initiated in the 50s in the first study which said that smokers develop lung cancer and smokers die prematurely it was a study in british male doctors uh, and that's why it's called British Male Doctor Study. Uh, a follow-up, 60 years follow-up, yeah? Uh, they followed up smokers and they found that smoker, smoking reduces the risk of um, developing Parkinson's disease. In my opinion, it's very clear that it's not smoking, it's nicotine. Uh, but they were looking at smokers and that's what they found. They found the effects of uh, smoking. It's not a surprise at all. 
we knew that a long time ago. I don't think anyone is surprised. Uh, so uh, it's basically a, a verification of what we knew through a huge study with a huge period of follow-up, I mean, 60 years, that verifies our findings. And I strongly believe in that case too, that if these people were taking a cleaner form of nicotine, they would have fared much better and they would have much lower risk compared to what they showed through the through smoking. I'd like to I'd like to ask on on that point. As as you said, it was quite a striking uh, conclusion from this study, and you'd think that it would have gathered more press than it actually did, but the media didn't really go too close to it. So I'm, I'm kind of asking, but you know, there's some like 40 or 50 studies every month on on nicotine, uh, and there's probably thousands. I think the Skier Committee for the EU TPD is looking at 2,700 studies, and yet the only ones that seem to get headlines are the ones that have got scary outcomes, and a lot of them are funded by people like Michael Bloomberg. So how do we get positive results and positive messages up in the media? How can we stop all the research just being terrible headlines and, and scaring people away from nicotine okay. in general? Before coming here, I had an interview and um, we were discussing the issue of nicotine and COVID-19. And they were asking me about um, these findings and these studies being contradictory to the narrative of the WHO. Um, which is, you know, smoking makes it more severe, it makes people more susceptible to COVID and so on. My response was that I'm a scientist and thus a scientist, uh, narratives are not my job. Uh, my job is to look at the data, analyze the data, and whatever I find, good, bad, ugly, strange, paradoxical, I need to publish everything I find. But it's not my job to create narratives and to try to uh, substantiate or justify narratives. So I don't care about narratives. If one of my studies is favoring one narrative, they can use it. I'm not doing a study and I'm not releasing results because I want to support uh, an X or a Y narrative. I'm doing the studies because I feel that the study, any study I do has some value and I want to see what's happening with, you know, every study has a purpose and whatever I find, I publish it because that's what the data are saying. Now, if it favors one narrative or another narrative, that's not even, not only not my job, but I don't even care which narrative it may, um, you know, support or, um, you know, be against um, um, against uh, another narrative. What I care is about data generating and publishing data, which can help us make decisions or make changes in products or, you know, improve our policies, improve our understanding, provide better advice to the patients. But narratives is not my job. So. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what you are saying is that, you know, there is a selective uh, presentation by the media of studies that support a specific narrative. That's not science. And that's a big problem. I don't know what... So we need, we need better science journalists then, basically. <laughs> you need better access to the media. That's a, the, the problem since the beginning has been access to the media. Yeah. Okay. We've got we've got another question from Christopher Snowden on on the uh, workings of your science. People hospitalised with COVID nineteen are on average between sixty and seventy. What's the smoking rate amongst people this age in China, and are your findings adjusted for age? Uh, in the in the first study, no. But in the latest study, which is going to be published in a few days, that was a surprise that I hoped no one would ask. But we did a gender and an age adjustment. So the problem with the age adjustment is that we had no idea what was the age of the smokers. We knew the average age of all patients. And I can tell you that in all our studies, the average age of the patients in all cases was below 60. It was from 40, 45 
to I think the uh, the highest average age was 57 or something like that. Uh, it was not 70 for sure. So, but we had no idea what's the age of the smokers. That's the amount, the data that they were giving us. So what we did is something which I, I, I can say it was creative. We used a worst case scenario. We chose the population group with the lowest smoking rate, which is above 65 years old. So we performed an age adjustment. You will see it in a few days. And the age adjustment we, that we performed is the assumption that all patients are above 65 years old. And that was uh, higher than the average age. The average age in all the studies, and we have a table displaying the average age, was lower than 65, lower than 60 in all studies. But the age adjustment was up 65 or higher. So we used the population smoking rates in the age groups 65 and older. For China, for France, for US, in all our assessments, the expected number of smokers was based on gender adjustment ones. So females and males who were hospitalized and respective female and male population prevalence and age adjustment using the worst case scenario, which is an assumption that everyone was uh, aged 65 or older. And based on that, so what I said before is that what we found was one third the expected prevalence, and that was based on the age and gender adjustment, both. When we did only the gender adjustment, it was one fourth to one fifth the expected prevalence. But I didn't even mention that. I mentioned the one third the expected prevalence. That's 66% lower. That's what it means. Two thirds lower than what you would expect based on both age and gender adjustment. And as I said, the age adjustment we did underestimates the expected prevalence, not the true prevalence. It underestimates the expected prevalence. Right. You spoiled yeah. the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I, I submitted my proof corrections yesterday, so I think it's just a matter of a few days until it is released publicly. The study was accepted on May 28, many days ago. It's just that, you know, it takes time for the journals until they prepare the documents and send you for the uh, syntax error corrections and so on. Well, th this brings us on, you're saying that's current research because you, you released a, uh, or a paper of yours was published a few days ago, was it not, about um, uh, changes in e-cigarette use and marijuana use in US adolescents. We've got a screen to share of that. Um, do you want to talk very briefly about that and what you found from that? It's uh, a paper that we are trying to publish for more than a year. There is um, an amazing um, um, level of, 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 of resistance to that by the reviewers. I'm not suggesting that the journals didn't do their job correctly. They have to follow what the reviewers are uh, telling them. But we had very, very strong resistance because it's a contro controversial issue. Well, what we found is that Yes, in U.S. adolescents, using the National Youth Tobacco Survey, the survey that is published, is, is, is done, is performed by the U.S. CDC. So it's not our own data. We just downloaded the data set and we analyzed that. There was an increase in e-cigarette use from 2017 to 2018. But the use by uh, never smoking youth was largely experimental and by far, by far lower than the rates of use among uh, youth with a positive smoking history. A big difference, big difference. 16% of frequent smokers were using e-cigarettes daily versus 0.48%, so 0.5, let's say, percent of never smoking youth using e-cigarettes daily. Uh, uh, 
30 times lower. Yes. So a, a big difference between never smokers and kids with a smoking history, current or former smokers. Unfortunately, the problem is that while the same study is assessing both uh, tobacco cigarette use and e-cigarette use, you never see the authorities presenting the two data combined. And I don't understand why we keep on discussing about current use, which is past 30 day use, which means that someone may take one puff per month and he or she is a current user in the same way that someone who is a daily user and he or she is also considered a, a current user. And no one discusses about the smoking status of e-cigarette users. I, I, I don't even understand that. I published one study about the 2015 NYTS. Now the study uh, with our colleagues, with my colleagues uh, for 2017 and 18. And the second very important message is that the vast majority of adolescents who are using e-cigarettes reported ever marijuana use with any cigarette. It's close to 70% of everyone, even 60% of never smoking adolescents who use e-cigarettes, they reported ever marijuana use with any cigarette, 60% of them. And what's the value of ever marijuana? Well, none, but unfortunately, the problem with, I mean, what's the value of the information about ever marijuana? It's very limited, but this was the only question that was available in the CDC. We were the first in the NYTS study by the CDC. We were the first to analyze that. And the main point of our paper is that with this information, with this question, it is impossible to understand what proportion of adolescents may be using the cigarettes predominantly or even ex exclusively for marijuana use. And this is a very important research question. So we suggested that the CDC should expand the questionnaire on e-cigarette, on marijuana use with an e-cigarette and add more questions examining frequency of use and so on. But we published our study with this suggestion what the CDC did in 2019 was remove even the question about ever use. So now they don't have any question about marijuana use in any cigarette. They imply that when you talk about e cigarettes, you also include marijuana into that, which is completely inappropriate for a simple reason. I would accept that for nicotine or non nicotine PG and VG based liquids, flavors may be a reason for using these products. For marijuana, flavors are irrelevant. No one is going to use marijuana because of flavors. Marijuana liquids are lipid-based, lipid-soluble um, uh, uh, liquids. Uh, nicotine or non-nicotine flavored liquids are water-soluble uh, um, uh, liquids. They are very, very different. Uh, they need different standards. They need different regulation. They have different composition, different ingredients. They need a different regulatory framework. So there is absolutely no rational in including everything into one category and call it a cigarette use. And look at what happened with the valley. The vast majority of the population believes that a valley was caused by nicotine liquids, while the nicotine liquids are completely irrelevant to the valley. <laughs> It was very easy to prove that. And why? Because for 10 years, we never had any outbreak of acute lung disease in any country, not even in the US. And suddenly in 2019, we have an outbreak only in the US, while the same nicotine e-liquids have been used for 10 years all over the world. It didn't make any sense that nicotine liquids were associated with the valley. But the way it was approached by the authorities and this misinformation about and, mis, and, and this bad terminology, the terminology problem that we call everything we evaporated in hail, we call it an e-cigarette, 
creating this misperception which is propagated. It's not, you know, it's not being addressed at all. It gets worse over time. It's un unbelievable and unacceptable. It's bad public health. Right, yeah, but this leads into, uh, we, we, we're coming to the end here, really. we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. So this, this one from Judy Gibson again, um, she's got asking, does the NNA have sufficient traction with NHS England and Public Health England to request all new cases of COVID-19 or asked if they currently use e-cigarettes or hate not burn? Now, I just sort of reword that question a little bit. You were talking about the distinction between different, different things. Is it not the case now that, that because of these surprising results we've seen with COVID-19, and nicotine that, that routinely when people are admitted to hospital they should be asked about which form of nicotine they take rather than just do you smoke yes 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 it, it needs to be differentiated because i think that and especially if my hypothesis about nicotine is correct that inhaling a cleaner nicotine product like e-cigarettes and um, um, heated tobacco products or anything is going to be if nicotine is beneficial you're going to see stronger benefits in these people than in smokers. Because in smokers, you may have a benefit from nicotine, but you also have the adverse effect of the combustion products. So uh, one counteracts the other, and you may, uh, you may have, uh, as I said, a partial masking of the benefits of nicotine. So you know, yes, it's very important to differentiate between um, nicotine products. I fully agree with uh, you, and I hope Judy is not our only viewer because Judy is asking a lot of questions. <laughs> no, we've, we've got quite a full room. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> and we've got plenty of questions, but we're not going to be able to get through them all, unfortunately. But um, I'd like to finish on this one uh, from Jeff Cliff, who's a smoker of 50 odd years and he made the switch to vaping six and a half years ago. Um, he's talking about the research and he's indebted to you for your efforts in that regard. But do you see this as an ongoing mission? Oh, yes, for many years, <laughs> unfortunately. And, uh, you know, when I first uh, entered this research arena and this research field, I, I, I couldn't understand why this is happening. Uh, it, it wouldn't make sense in any other research area. Uh, the level of politics and emotion here uh, overcomes any uh, scientific, uh, you know, principle and... Um, um, uh, conduct that we see in other research fields. It's unbelievable. People who don't work in the tobacco control arena uh, and in tobacco control public health, you know, uh, field, uh, when you explain to them in simple words what's the e-cigarette or what are these alternative products, uh, they don't understand why there is any controversy or any uh, you know, intense debate about these products. They don't get it. They don't understand why there is opposition. Um, but, you know, uh, people who know what's the tobacco control arena, they, we see that the things are very, very different. You know what? I think this will be recorded in history as um, uh, a black period, uh, a very unfortunate and embarrassing period in public health in the same way that the first years of a the AIDS epidemic were recorded in history and for the WHO um, reaction and approach and everything as a black period, as a medieval period for public health, as it has been for harm reduction for intravenous drug users. I think this is also, or potentially worse, I must say. Why? Because it's so many lives at stake. Uh, I'll be honest with you, if e-cigarettes were supported by the vast majority of the governments, the regulators, and the scientific community, I think we would have been very close to eliminating, sm eliminating smoking everywhere in the world, including the poor countries. Because if there was support, there would have been motives to create cheaper products produced locally, even in low and middle income countries, which would have been much more affordable for people who now smoke or use local pretty bad products. And we would have almost eliminated smoking. It's this opposition by the parts of the tobacco control 
uh, field. It's parks, not all of them. And by the regulatory authorities and this over precautionary, I, I call it usually abuse of the precautionary principle that has stalled the progress, progress that would have been made by just accepting that we may know very few things, but at least these products, e-cigarettes, don't have any combustion. And that's enough evidence at the beginning in early 2010 to accept that this is a less harmful product. And that's it. We don't need anything more. I, I totally agree with you about history. We'll judge this very badly. I, I've had that very thought many times myself. Yeah. So and and good luck with your ongoing battle with these people. Uh, we're all behind you, obviously. Uh, so um, we're going to have to come to a close, I'm afraid, because we run out of time. But but yeah, thank you, Constantinos, for for giving us your time. We know you're very busy. Uh, you came hot foot from was it a radio show in Botswana or something? Yeah, you, you yeah, have yeah. These all the time. So so we are indebted to you for giving us some of your time. And and it was a great discussion. So I just like to say that one little thing. Actually, you talked about um, uh, marijuana, and uh, we have had an idea of maybe doing one of these webinars on dry herb vaporizers or something so uh, maybe people who are watching could keep an eye out for that uh, if you enjoyed this we obviously plan to do more but we really need your support so uh, if you can follow us on our facebook page or on twitter uh, at nn alliance or you can sign up as a supporter at nnalliance.org where you can find many ways of donating to the nna uh, find and subscribe to our youtube channel where we were publishing these videos and maybe in the future streaming them uh, and most of all, we rely on private donations. So please see our donate page on the website. Or if you're in the UK, simply text NNA plus the donation amount to 70085. So um, thank you again, Constantinos. And I hope everyone enjoyed it and have a pleasant, uh, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Uh, have a good evening. We hope to see you next time. Good thank night. you. Bye, everyone. Bye.